So in our study of marks of a Christian, last week we looked at separation. This week we are looking at stewardship. Stewardship, usually we think of money, but we'll find in our lesson today that stewardship for the New Testament Christians was everything that they owned. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Our lesson text is out of First Timothy, but we're going to be looking at a few verses as we begin in our introduction, starting with Peter. My grandmother used to always tell a story of a little boy that started going to Sunday school, and one of the things they always wanted you to do is memorize your memory verse, bring your Bibles, be on time, and bring an offering of some kind. And the teacher would always tell this new little boy, bring money for Jesus. And about after about five or six weeks, every Sunday, the teacher saying, bring money for Jesus. The little boy looked at her and says, why is Jesus all the time broke? <laughs> And we're going to find out Jesus ain't broke today. (laughs) First Peter 4.10, as every man and woman has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. J.B. Phillips in his translation said, serve one another with the particular gifts that God has given each of you as faithful dispensers of the magnificently varied grace of God, so that God may be glorified in everything through Jesus Christ. Believers are stewards under God of all that they own, all that they are and all that they will become. They are stewards of those gifts from God. One preacher said, who you are is God's gift to you, What you become is your gift to God. Adrian Rogers said, What you do not freely give, God neither needs nor wants. Evangelist Billy Sunday, If you could take it with you, it would melt where some people are going. (laughs) Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Just after Della and I were married, we went to a small church in Ontario. We met up with a young couple. Both had just graduated from a Bible college up near San Jose. That Bible college is not there anymore. That young fellow insisted that tithing was the Old Testament teachings and philosophies, and it wasn't meant for Christians. I told him, well, you know, the Old Testament saints believed that 10% belonged to God, but the New Testament saints believed everything belongs to God. Adrian Rogers said, Abraham commenced it, Jacob continued it, Malachi commanded it, Jesus commended it, and who are you to cancel it? There's three lessons that we can learn about stewardship gifts. First, it's an individual obligation. Second, there is a diverse assortment of stewardship gifts. And third, their purpose is God-honoring through Jesus Christ. Biblically, spiritual gifts are not gifts of the apostles. They are gifts of the Holy Spirit. They did not stop when the apostles died. They are not the apostles' gifts. They are the Holy Spirit's gifts. He's still here, and they are still real. He insisted that tithing... Well, excuse me, wrong wrong paragraph. Back up. (laughs) Sorry about that. Did you ever hear the story about the little boy that was at the grocery store and this really large lady was in front of him and her beeper went off and the, bo- the little boy said, Mama, back up, she's backing up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> the gifts of the Holy Spirit are still available to every Christian as long as the Holy Spirit is still here working on the earth. Spiritual gifts are different from natural talents and abilities. They are special abilities available after we are redeemed. They are not meant to be kept and hoarded up for our own personal benefit or enjoyment. They are to be used, shared with obligation. Listen, what Adrian Rogers said, what you do not give freely and willingly, God neither needs nor wants. Give it as unto the Lord. I read an article this last week about a guy that was a musician, and it reminded me of Ken. They, oh, what a wonderful musician you are. And Ken would look at you and say, practice. I sure wish I could play like you. Practice. You have such a wonderful talent. 
practice. <laughs> what can I do to get that same talent? Practice. Yeah. Practice. God has entrusted us with the responsibility of ministering to others with our spiritual gifts. One day we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of our stewardship of these gifts. Remember the story of the, the three servants. One got ten, one got two, one got one or something like that. The guy that got one buried it. Bad news. We should exercise our gifts with care and diligence to be a good steward of it. Let the benefits of these gifts be shared both in the church and beyond the church. It is incumbent upon each believer to ask themselves penetrating questions about their own stewardship. All that we have is a token of God's mercy given to us for his glory. Do you know how many people Jesus healed that didn't believe in him? A bunch. He didn't wait for them to go down to the altar and get saved before he touched them and healed them. You see somebody that's a sinner and needs a touch of God and needs a healing? Ask them, is it okay if I pray for you in the name of Jesus? Because I believe he heals. Amen. Doesn't matter whether you do or not, I do. Amen. You feel led of the Lord? Be led of the Lord. Do it. Those that were healed did. They got attached to the Lord. Remember the, the, the demonic of Gadara? That Jesus casted out so many demons out of that guy that they went into a herd of swine and the herd, and the herd of swine killed themselves? Yeah. I don't blame him. <laughs> huh? And he wanted to follow Jesus and he says, no, I want you to stay here and witness and testify of the glory that God has shown in your life. And he did. He became an evangelist to his hometown. The scriptures teach that where a man's treasure is, there will we will find his heart as well. You want to take an inventory of your heart? Here's how you can do it. Take a look at your bank book, your credit card statement, and find out what you're doing with your money. It shows you where your heart is. The Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. God cannot bless what you do not give. One of God's covenants with man is the law of seed time and harvest, which he says will not fail. Genesis 8:22. God established the laws of seed time and harvest. The farmer plants his seed, knowing God brings the increase. Likewise, we sow seeds into the kingdom of God and he brings the harvest. What harvest are you looking for today? Isn't the purpose to win souls or are you sowing in order to become prosperous? The axiomatic truth of Christian principles is that when you support the spreading of the gospel and solid Bible teachers, God will meet your needs and more. Amen. But if you're giving in order to get something back, you're going to be disappointed. Yeah. Remember this parable that Jesus told of a farmer with his seed. He scattered his seed and then Jesus talked about four different kinds of soil receiving the seed. Do you notice the farmer didn't watch to see where he was scattering the seed? He didn't say, oh, no, you're rocky soil. I don't give you some. Oh, no, you got weeds in your heart. I don't give you some. You're as hard as flint. I don't give you some. The farmer gave it to everybody. And some of it landed on good soil and it produced fruit. Somebody said, that's four different kinds of people. And I said to him, no, it's four different kinds of you. Because sometimes you're hard. Sometimes you're rocky. Sometimes you're so controlled by the things of this world. You can't receive the seed, which is God's word. Amen. Amen. Your heart needs to be prepared to receive the seed of God that will grow in your life and produce a likeness of Jesus Christ in you Amen. by your humbly submitting to the teaching and to the word of God. Jesus said, judge not. You know what? There ain't a sinner on planet Earth that does not know that verse. They don't know anything about the Bible, but they know that one. Judge not. That verse is used to condemn every Christian who points out sin in the lives of other people. Judge not, they say. Then they turn around and these sinners judge Christians. They holler, they emote, they blather, they blither about judging as they judge. The very next thing Jesus says in that verse of Matthew chapter 7, verse 2 the next thing he says is for you to judge, to not cast pearls before swine. And the rest of those verses up to verse six that talk about judging, 
He's telling you several times you need to discern what you are doing with God's word and what you are doing talking with some people who do not care to hear truth. Christians who point out sins are not judging anybody. Like a doctor who says you have cancer, is that a judgment of you? No. He's pointing out a sickness that needs to be cured. Christians say this is a sin. It needs to be cut out of your life. Stop sinning. It's a diagnosis and it's fixable. God tells sinners and saints alike, the way you judge is the same way you will be judged. Why do I bring this up? Because God and Jesus say the same thing about seed time and harvest, about stewardship. He says, give, and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Right? And then he continues, for the same measure that you give is the same measure that you will receive. The message takes that and says, generosity begets generosity. You and I are the ones who decide how much God can bless us, and it's determined on How you give the same measuring percentage that you share is the same measuring percentage that you receive. God will give it back. That is his law of seed time and harvest. Beloved, it's not important how much you give. It's how much you have left over. The theological note. I found a Christian teacher one time on the Web and he was talking about Luke 638. And he said, that's the law of karma. And I screamed at my computer. No, it isn't. You false teacher. The name of his site is called the Holy Spirit is my teacher. No, he's listening to the wrong spirit. It ain't the Holy Spirit, Bubba. I was infuriated. Listen to his quote. Whatever you sow, you will reap, whether good or bad, good or worse. Good or evil, whatever, this is the law of karma. God is faithful. Ah! (laughs) This guy has mixed up pagan mysticism and scripture and called it biblical teaching. Karma has nothing to do with the Bible. It comes from the teachings of Hinduism and Buddhism. And simply put, it's a term about the cycle of cause and effect. According to the theory of karma, what happens to a person happens because they caused it with their actions. Pastor Jeff Shirley was talking to a teenager about karma, and he said, the Bible teaches that you will reap what you sow. And the teenager said, ah, that's it. That's exactly the same thing, karma and what the Bible says. And he says, no, it isn't. (laughs) Sowing and reaping only applies to Christians. Non-Christians are already judged. No good work can change that. Listen, the teachings of karma are not compatible with the Bible. Karma centers around the concept of reincarnation, and it's an eternal cycle of cause and effect. Karma eliminates the idea of a personal God, his sovereignty, his right to judge, and his love. How people escape the cycle of karma and enter into nirvana, which is what is taught by the Buddhists, is a human way of gaining salvation through performance. That's the whole idea behind karma. You gain the ability to cut off the cycle of things that have happened in your life by the way you act. That's self-salvation. We don't teach self-salvation in Christianity. We teach salvation by faith through grace of God in Christ Jesus alone, period. Nothing added to it. How many of you know that Jesus is watching you every time you put something in the offering plate? How would you like me to look over your shoulder every time Della passes around the little basket? (laughs) See what you're doing. (laughs) Jesus is. Luke 21, 1 through 4, Jesus is in the temple watching the rich people put offerings into the collection plate. And along comes this little widow woman who quietly sneaking in puts in two pennies. Jesus halts the parade. I tell you the truth, he hollers. This poor woman has put in more than everyone else. They have given a small amount out of their abundance, but out of her poverty, she has given all. Listen, she had two coins, neighbor. She could have gave one. She gave both of them. I told you the story in the past 
long time ago, Dell and I were following Oral Roberts, and he was talking about seed faith. We were down to 10 bucks in our bank account after we paid the bills and had stuff set aside for groceries. We were broke. I was working two and three jobs. I gave five bucks, planted as a seed faith. Within a few months, I had a new job, a new work, and a big increase in our finances, and we never looked back since. I've wondered sometimes if I'd have gave ten instead of the five. Oh, God, whoa, what God would have done with the ten. <laughs> I'm completely broken, depending on you, Lord. <laughs> I don't know where I've been. Maybe I've been a multimillionaire by now. I don't know, but God met our need. Because we were sowing into His work. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you. Stewardship is the temperature gauge on the dashboard of your heart, brother. It registers God's ability to bless you. God has given us an astounding way to invest in the eternal kingdom of God. Your treasures follow you into eternity. Don't hoard your treasures on earth. Lay up your treasures in heaven. Where your treasure is, the desires of your heart is. If earthly treasures are grabbed up for selfish purposes, then possessions will become a curse. I couldn't help but think about that after I wrote it down. It says the stewardship is the temperature gauge on the dashboard of your heart. I made that one up. <laughs> I thought, ooh, that's pretty good. <laughs> and then I got to thinking about, you know, the, 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 the gauge that tells you how close you're getting on empty. Yeah. And I thought, I wonder where my gauge is. <laughs> We, our, our, our uh, car, it'll put a little warning sign on the dash. It says, hey, you got 15% left until you got to go change your oil. Yep. And I thought, well, that's a nice little thing. I can go 15% more. Okay, I'll get down to 10. <laughs> bing, 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 bing. You're down to 10%. Go get your oil changed. I wish God would do that. Your blessing funnel is getting clogged up by your selfishness. Stop it. <laughs> I want to pour blessings into your life. Amen. Be a steward of all that you are, and I will bless you. First Timothy 6, 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Everything stays, even our mortal bodies will stay here when we die. Right? Yeah. It's the love, the passionate desires of money which is avarice, that is the root source of all evils. Yeah. Beloved men and women will commit any sin or crime in the name of money. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Verse 11. But you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, pursue godliness and faith and love and endurance and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Verse 12. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Verse 13. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Jesus Christ who will testify before Pontius Pilate, made a good confession. I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal, who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Then he continues, Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put off their hope and wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this, they may lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed have departed 
from faith. Grace be with you all. We have three things. First, forsake materialism. Secondly, follow eternal values. And third, pursue true riches. Forsake materialism. Top of page three. The two things people don't want preachers to talk about are sex and money. But the two things that people want to know the most about are sex and money. A deacon board was looking for a new pastor. One of the deacons gave a prayer during their meeting and said, God, send us an honest salt of the earth, poor and humble pastor. God, if you keep him humble, I guarantee we'll keep him poor. (laughs) God told Malachi, chastise the people for these two things in chapter 3 of Malachi. They complain that it ain't worth it to serve me. And number two, they have kept back my tithes and offerings. Abraham was the first person in the Bible to pay tithes in Genesis 14. He gave to Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and a prophet of the Lord. When Jacob had a dream about a ladder and angels, he said, surely I will pay a tithe to you, a tenth, Genesis 28. Jesus scolded the Pharisees, you hypocrites, you blind guides, you strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Matthew 23 and Luke 11. But in the middle of this, he complimented them on their stewardship. He says, you should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. In the King James, it says, you give a tenth even to the cumin and mint leaf, which thing you should do. But don't forget justice, mercy, and faithfulness. In Acts chapter 2, verses 42 and 47, and chapter 4, verses 31 and 34, the first Christians, which were Jews in Jerusalem, were were together and held all things in common. They saw their stewardship as including sharing their time in fellowship, studying the word, sharing their gifts of the spirit, their finances and their possessions, sharing food from house to house and praising God. And in chapter 4, it says there was no needy among them. If Christians were Christians the way they're supposed to be Christians, we would not need a welfare state. What's a good steward? A steward in the Bible was a personal, trusted servant who acted as the manager of the house of his master. Joseph was a steward in Potiphar's house. Paul considered himself a steward and a servant of the Lord And his house, the church. Abraham's steward was Eliezer. Joseph, it is recorded, had a steward in Egypt. And Isaiah, in chapter 22, condemns a steward because he built for himself a tomb among the tombs of the kings. He said, you don't belong there. We got one pastor. He's the pastor. Respect him. Pray for him. You are not gifted with the Holy Spirit gift of correcting pastors. He answers To Jesus Christ and to God, you don't like something, you get on your knees and talk to the one who's in charge. Because I'm telling you, you're going to end up like the people that Malachi was correcting, because this is his anointed servant. And in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, it refers to every pastor of every church as a star in the hand of Christ Jesus himself. Remember what he said about David? He's the apple of my eye. People start poking David, they're poking God in his eye. Do I disagree with Pastor John? Yeah, sometimes. God bless his heart. He corrects me to no end. He's up there preaching and he's telling me where I'm wrong. I go, ha, 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 how did he know that? (laughs) Paul directed Timothy on being God's steward. If you lay all these instructions before the brethren, you will be a worthy steward and a good minister of Christ Jesus, ever nourishing your own self on the truths of faith. Paul instructed Titus in chapter 1 when he talks about the stewards. For the bishop or an overseer, as God's steward, he must be this, blameless, hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word. Be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it 
where they are wrong. A false steward, Paul talks about in 1 Timothy 6, he says they are those who contradict Paul's teachings or the wholesome teachings of Christ. Isn't that interesting? Paul said, if you disagree with me, you're a false teacher. How would you like to come in here Sunday morning and have me tell you that? (laughs) If you disagree with me, you're a false teacher. Neener, neener. (laughs) I don't think I'd do that, but I know Paul was right on. Okay? He says they are arrogant. They lack understanding. Such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over meaning of words. They parse words as a technical term. They split hairs over words. This steers up arguments and ending in jealousy, ending in division and slander and evil suspicions of one another. These people are always causing trouble. Their minds are corrupt and they have turned their backs on truth. To them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. You got them on TV. Be careful. In Titus 1, 7, Paul again says what a steward should not do, should not be self-willed, should not be arrogant or presumptuous. He must not be quick tempered or given to drink. And the word that is used there is for wine. Pugnacious, which is brawling and violent. He must not be grasping and greedy for filthy lucre. I read this last week in Christianity Today talking about two different ministers who were arrogant, brawling and bullies in the office. And the church dismissed both of them. And it said it wasn't because of what they taught is because of the way they lived. They are not acceptable in our midst as ministers and will never be received here again. I thought, wow, one's in Washington, the other one's in Texas. And they were on TV, neighbor. One of them had nine different churches he was pastor of. Wow. These people had worldwide ministries. And they got caught up in this. They had the ability to touch lives for God and for good. But they got caught up in themselves. What a sad commentary. You know what? The Bible says that a gift of God is without repentance. I look forward to the day when those guys get their heads screwed on straight, repent, and get back into the ministry because they had good things to say. And I believe God's gift can be steered up in their lives one more time that they can reach out to others. But in the meantime, they're going to have to get retrained on a few things. Uh I need training. I need correcting. That's why I got married. (laughs) (laughs) If you think you're perfect, get married. (laughs) You'll find out. <laughs> 1 Timothy 6 says, Be content with what you have. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress neighbors we don't like. Adrian Rogers said, If you don't have what you like, then like what you have. Paul said, Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. John Hagee said, The man is rich whose family is united, even if he possesses nothing. Paul uses the word contentment as a mark of godliness. This includes being independent of the world and the circumstances of life. Faith in God makes a believer independent from the stuff and the mess of life. Independent contentment in Christ produces an attitude that is not spiteful over the present nor anxious about the future. Faith is the result of a confidence in the promises of God. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Faith says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, therein to be content. Not content with the state, but in a state of a mess, content with my relationship with the living God. I know in whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he will keep what I have committed to him Against the day of judgment. Listen, our personality should be an expression of godly faith in our devotion and service to the Lord and in our practical duties and ministries of the church. These goals are best achieved when we are content in our relationship with Christ. 
Being rich is not a sin. Being wealthy is not a sin. Having stuff is not a sin. It's when that stuff gets in your heart. Having riches carries its own set of problems. We got more money now that we're retired than we ever had before. And everybody and his brother is calling me on the phone or sending me mail. Ooh, we'd like to have some of your money over here. Get the hints in Jesus' name. Oh, my word. The lust for riches produces greed, which produces jealousy, which produces hatred, which can lead to violence. The wealthy should never feel or expect preferential treatment, which is pride. Fools think they can solve problems with money. See how many fools we got in Congress? Throw money at it. The wealthy should never feel or expect preferential treatment. They don't think that money's going to solve problems. It don't. Riches easily disappear. Faith and hope in the living God is eternal contentment. Amen. Follow eternal values. Fight in the noble fight in behalf of faith. False teachers are engaged in verbal battles and splitting hairs over word meanings. That's the tactic of Satan, well learned by our politicians and corrupt lawyers. Pick your battles. Ignore the yeah, but scoffing fault finder who only wants to argue. Don't give them any of your time. Give them the gospel on the run. Don't let them hang you up. Pick your battles. We are running in a race where the reward is a crown of glory and eternal life. Cheaters will not win. Only those who follow after Christ win. Walk the talk. Philippians 1.27 Keep your eyes on the goal of the resurrection from the dead. Chapter 3, verse 13 Help others strive for that same goal. Philippians 4.3 and keep up the struggle of salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. 1 Timothy 6.12 Ephesians 6, 11, 13, and 14 says this. Stand. Withstand. Stand therefore. And having done all, stand. Stand against the devil. Stand against the world. Stand against the temptations of this world. Stand for Jesus Christ and Him alone. You're the winner. Paul urges Timothy to faithfully guard the trust that God had committed into his care. The gospel is too important for us to waste time either in empty talk or circular arguments of the arrogant, intellectual, corrupted by the worldly science of philosophies. The church has been taught, if we give to him, he will give to us. If our attitude in giving is only to get, we violate the basic precepts of the gospel. Agape love gives without expecting anything in return. When it says, for God so loved the world, it uses the word agape, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. It's the message again of the farmer scattering the seed, which is the word of God. Yes, some of it lands on stony soil. Yes, some of it goes into thorny soil. Yes, some of it lands on tough, hard road. But some of it lands on good soil. And you don't know the heart, but God knows the heart. You scatter the seed is what he's asked us to do. And he'll take care of the soil. Don't expect anything in return. Jesus said, give in secret. Don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing. And your father, who sees in secret, will reward you openly. God will choose how and when. Let him be the one who rewards you. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Paul said, all the things I once taught were so important are gone from my life compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master. Firsthand, everything I once taught I had going for me is insignificant dog dung. Greek says exactly that. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ Jesus and be embraced by him. I do all in the pursuit of the person who died for me that I might grasp him and that he might grasp me. To God be the glory. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing on your word.
May it prosper and bring fruit to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. See you next week. All right.